inside Indiana overtime. This is Zach Osterman. This is Zach Osterman. It's also 2 a.m. It's 1.56 in the morning. And um, we just finished talking to Tom Crane literally probably, I don't know, 270 seconds ago. So, um, and it <laughs> smells like burnt, like used motor oil or something around here. Anyway, whatever. Um, so, Indiana, uh, 58, Ohio State, 67. That's obviously what we're talking about. Uh, a missed opportunity to... Uh, to clinch the Big Ten title outright at home on senior night. Um, you know, in just just a weird night in a lot of ways. Um, the game itself never really felt like it took on any kind of personality to it. Um, you know, I, I, like the, I mean, I could tell you why Ohio State won the game, but I, I there was never really a flow to it. There was never a natural rhythm to it. It was very choppy, very kind of broken up. Um, which is the way Ohio State wanted it. They wanted to turn it into a defensive game. Um, you know, they were not nearly so prolific rebounding the ball as Minnesota, but it was the same kind of idea where it felt like Wisconsin, or excuse me, uh, Ohio State uh, really just kind of wanted to take everything straight to Indiana and force Indiana to keep its composure when it was kind of getting pushed around a little bit. Um, and I mean that both literally and figuratively, and Indiana just kind of didn't. There were a lot of rush shots, a lot of uh, empty possessions, a lot of bad possessions. They only had 12 turnovers, but Ohio State had eight steals, um, so eight of those 12 were uh, directly forced. There were a lot of possessions, particularly down the stretch. I think they turned the ball over five times in the last eight minutes, um, and it just felt like you know every moment that... Um, Every moment when it seemed like Indiana might push back into the game, particularly in those last 10 or 12 minutes, the Hoosiers made a mistake of some kind, whether it was a bad shot, whether it was a turnover, whether they allowed an offensive rebound that reset a shot clock for Ohio State. It was kind of, it was almost death by a thousand paper cuts for Indiana tonight, and and, and the game just never really seemed... They, other than a very brief stretch at the beginning of the second yeah. half when I think they made the first seven shots, you never felt like Indiana got this game sped up or at least got this game to a point where their confidence was such that they could knock down shots and, and maybe grind out a win a little bit like they did against Iowa. And obviously Ohio State's better than Iowa and much improved from when Indiana beat them in Columbus. But, you know, Ohio State wanted to drag this game, you know, through the swamp, and they did, and they won. Yeah, and it, I mean, you mentioned that you know, especially in those last five minutes, it just seemed like even even the IU possess, offensive possessions themselves never really took on much of a much of a rhythm, much of an identity. A lot of them didn't even seem really to get started before um, you know someone would come, you know, an Ohio State player would come up and get a steal just almost off the bat. It seemed like, um, and so the, those last five minutes were just uh, the last five or seven or eight minutes just seemed like. Um, I just never, they're always within, seemed like they're within striking distance and never seemed to be able to even have much of a chance to make up ground and even make it a one possession game. And then obviously it stretched out into 11 um, with four or five minutes left. And then, and you know, they, they just weren't able to, to chip their way back into it um, much at all. I mean, Jordan Holtz hit a three late, but uh, the, the, there's just really nothing, there's no last gasp it seemed like there, there's really no last successful run that they made and apart from those those five minutes or you know five or eight minutes to start the half um they just couldn't quite figure it out and then of course in the first half uh Oladipo and Zeller I think only played uh 18 or 19 combined minutes yeah um, cause yeah because they both had two fouls Oladipo didn't score in the first half hardly even you know I, I don't even know if he had a he had maybe had like one shot two shots in the first half um, but was really barely even no shots. Fe- yeah, no time. shots. Uh, and so and well, I mean, in that obviously, I mean, Ohio State didn't. It, it, this wasn't part of it. Ohio State. Really got into Indiana's backcourt tonight. Um, I think they combined for three turnover or three assists and six turnovers um, between them. They shot nine of twenty-two. Yogi Ferrell shot three of ten, and Jordan Hulls and Victor Oladipo each only just took six shots. Um, none of them broke double digits in scoring they combined for 22 points on 22 shots which is incredibly inefficient especially for that group and um you know they tom cream talked about ohio state getting into indiana's drivers a little bit more which is to say it's ball handlers ohio state 
I mean, they defended a little bit differently in the post. Um, but if you look at it, Indiana still got 29 points from Watford, Christian Watford and Cody Zeller together. Mm-hmm. Where Ohio State really sort of stuck Indiana was that they really, really pressured the ball, and they've got the athletes to do it, and they've gotten a lot better at it in the last few weeks. They really pressured the ball early in possessions. They didn't let Indiana get into an offensive rhythm. You constantly felt in both halves like Indiana guards, when they had the ball, were trying to get rid of pressure, not so much looking for a way to initiate the offense. They couldn't, Indiana couldn't get a way, figure out a way to get them the space to let it go. Um, and as such, I think you saw Yogi. I mean, he had 10 shots tonight, Yogi Farrell. That was a, a co team high with Christian Watford. And I think a lot of that was when he felt like he just didn't see anything around him. And so he just thought a little bit like maybe the Iowa game um, that he just needed to kind of break down and make something happen offensively. The difference is um, he actually had some success with that, but Ohio State's a lot better perimeter defensive team than Iowa was, so there weren't a lot of kickouts. Um, Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of times where Farrell just seemed like, yeah, like you said, that he tried to make something happen. And even, you know, at the end of the first half, IU had the ball with like 25 seconds left or something like that. Um, and instead of it, just didn't, it didn't even seem like Farrell had, they had time to really focus they had on like anything around him. Five less seconds. They got the ball but, back with like thirty nine seconds on the could, game clock, so they could have bled. Yeah, it away. they could have really taken and instead the last they really rushed, good shot. And, and everything. And and this is hard to really quantify statistically, but everything felt rushed for Indiana tonight too. And I think that's something we're seeing. You know, Tom Crean sort of put it, maybe put it well, whether he meant to or not. He said that Ohio State just played smarter, and I think that we've seen that in some of these games, Minnesota in particular, uh, Ohio State tonight, maybe in spurts against Iowa, but in the last three games, and you could probably go back a little bit to the Butler game as well, um, Indiana gets nervous when things aren't working. You know, Tom Green called Victor Oladipo a flow player tonight. That You know, he talks about how we, Oladipo kind of needs to be in a rhythm to, 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 to play well. But that really kind of just applies to this whole team. And when they aren't in that rhythm, sometimes, especially against teams that are tough defensively, that can make them grind out possessions and that won't give them second-chance opportunities and can defend them fairly well without fouling, um, they really don't know how to do that, at least not effectively, not for long stretches. And when they do start to speed the game up, they struggle to keep it sped up like they did tonight against good against good ball handlers like Aaron Kraft. Um, and, you know, sometimes they just make... Again, it's, it's, it's death by a thousand paper cuts in the sense that they didn't turn the ball over a ton of times. They didn't uh, take a, you know, a ton of bad shots. They didn't give up a ton of offensive rebounds. They, they pulled in 10 of their own, but it was all these different little things where you felt like they just weren't locked in. They weren't doing enough of any one thing. They weren't holding onto the ball well enough. They weren't manufacturing good shots often enough. They weren't getting enough offensive rebounds. They weren't keeping Ohio state off the glass and uh, the defensive glass enough. Um, and that is something that this team, I think, has to address very quickly because the postseason obviously starts time. next week. Um, it's just kind of how can it succeed when it's not in that free-flowing rhythm that it loves to play at? Yeah, and and they're going to face, a, you know, obviously a variety of different teams, um, you know, even in Big Ten play in the next week and change, and then the tournament where they're, where they're going to face some different styles and going to have to... Um, make adjustments not only between games but within games and just um, need to really find multiple you know, uh, different ways to uh, different approaches maybe uh, that are going to work and you just find ways to be a little bit more flexible and not really rely on that flow or not really rely on that rhythm um, you know especially on the offensive end so I mean it'll be it'll be interesting to see I mean it, they're basically entering you know one game territory now I and mean, they have one game to win the outright Big Ten championship, and then they'll be playing in single elimination games the rest of the season. So um, it's you know it's going to get stressful very quickly. Obviously, um, starting Sunday uh, in Ann Arbor, which is the you know the, the regular season finale. Um, you know, a lot of people kind of looked at that as like, well, that could be that could be a huge game 
you know, to decide the Big Ten champion, and it, it, it's going to play a major role in, in deciding that. Um, and I think both of us are going to be there, yeah. I think. Um, yeah. And I don't know, we'll see what happens there. We'll see what the next few days holds um, for Indiana and for Michigan and for the Big Ten, really, to, just to see where things shake out. Because, I mean, well, there's yeah, just so many I mean, different... The scenarios right now, honestly, probably at this point, still favor Indiana getting the number one seed, whether they win in Michigan yeah. or not. Um, basically, if Michigan State is involved in any three-way, in, in any shared title tie situation, that means Wisconsin almost certainly will not be. In fact, Wisconsin will not be. Yeah. Because with, if they lost to Michigan, they couldn't catch Indiana. And if that happens, Indiana will have split with anybody else that could also be involved in that tie, and they will have beaten Michigan State, which will give them the tiebreaker. Michigan State both um, times. Yeah, they, they, they will be 2-0 and against Michigan State, which neither Ohio State nor Michigan could say. Um, right now, we think, and we're not positive on this, but if, if Michigan State were to... Right now, we think the lowest Indiana can drop is the number three seed in Chicago, but we're not crystal on that. Um, you know... Tom Crean likes to talk about rebounding as, uh, he, you know, he, he counts a rebound as a deflection. Um, he said that before, and um, he likes to talk about it as a reflection of hustle and, and toughness and physicality, and I don't think Indiana isn't playing with those things. But rebounding is something this team has got to do because rebounding ensures that opponents only get one possession. Mm-hmm. That gives Indiana better control of the game. When Indiana has better control of the game, Indiana has better control of the pace of the game. The more possessions Indiana has, the more chances they're going to have to to start knocking down shots, which eventually they will do. They have not played very well, at least shot very well, in the last three games. But eventually you would think that if they can ramp up the number of possessions in a game, they will eventually start knocking down shots, find that offensive rhythm, and then they can at least make a, a, a real run at taking control of the game Again, they lose the offensive rebounding battle tonight. They lose the overall rebounding battle tonight. They lose points in the paint. They lose points off turnovers. They lose second chance points. Uh, surprisingly, very surprisingly, they lose fast Get break points, out fourteen to two. Um, you know, and and it kind of cuts both ways because the other thing is that this team, I mean, any team really is going to start losing defensive focus if it has to defend for 45, 50, 60 seconds, and Against, Mich- against Minnesota and then again against Ohio State, we saw Indiana put itself in some of those bad some of those bad situations where they had opportunities to end possessions and they just didn't. And without sounding too critical, too basically critical, there were moments tonight where Ohio State just wanted it more. I mean, I can remember specifically late in kind of a crucial Ohio State possession Victor Oladipo sitting on the backside, uh, down on the block, the backside block, and a ball started coming off the rim, and he was right in position, but he didn't jump. He didn't jump for it, and Lindell Smith came over him and got it, and, and I think Ohio State pulled it back out and got another shot and made it. I'm, I don't quite remember, but the, I mean that that moment stood out. There was a moment late in the uh, in the game when Lindell Smith was shooting free throws, and I don't think Ohio State had anyone else in the lane. And Lindsell Smith followed his own shot, missed it, and got a re- and got the rebound. And I think he turned it over pretty quickly. But I mean, that that was a crucial rebound for Indiana to get, and they just didn't move for it. And you know, again, it's not really a question of effort; it's more a question of focus. And I think that this team is sharper when that rhythm is there, when that that just that confidence is there. It's got to figure out more ways to manufacture that confidence because the book on Indiana has now become right or wrong. If you can, if you can push them around a little bit, you can get them off their game mentally, and then you can speed them up offensively. And then if you can grind out possessions defensively and score, and or you can get offensive rebounds and really control the game simply by basically controlling the clock. I mean, almost like football. Then you will slow them down offensively. You will get them hurried up in their half court offense, and you will probably force them into bad shots and eventually bad decisions. I mean. Indiana kind of fell apart at the end of this game, and it wasn't really, again, a question of effort. It was more just a feeling like they just kind of ran out of answers and were forced, mm-hmm. pushing too hard and forcing things too much. And, you know, it, it, they, they it, at a certain point, they were just wound up so tightly that they snapped. And, you know, in the last, 
again, like the last eight minutes, it just it felt like every position, every possession was wasted. Everything was, everything was, you know, just going through the motions or um, a turnover or you know, too much time spent kind of waiting for something to happen. Just not knowing what to do. Yeah, I mean, it, it looked like they were trying to do something, but it it did not look like they were effective at doing it at all. Whatever the play call was, or whatever the situation was calling for. So. Um, yeah, I yeah. mean, it's an opportunity lost. They, you know, I, I know some people how they apparently they always present the trophy after you win at least a share of the Big Ten title. That's not anything new. Um, apparently, it happened last year at Michigan State on senior night when they lost to Ohio State. You know, I mean, the Nets. I don't know. I, I mean, I think. I think the Nets, I know a lot of fans were pretty upset about it. Quite frankly, that might be something that people reevaluate in a couple of days. And, I mean, I don't I don't see any harm in it. It just looked really weird. It was just a very awkward. I mean, it was very yeah. joyless. I mean, yeah, 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 exactly. The, the pictures, you know, the, just usually when you see a team hoisting a trophy, they're all, you know, they're all laughing. They're all smiling with each other. There were, you know, maybe a couple of them smiling and the rest of them just kind of being there like yeah you know wearing their yeah. hats holding the trophy cutting the net I mean it, it just didn't seem it was it, not it a, celebration. Like a celebration yeah it was not yeah. a celebration and I mean obviously senior night was somber mm-hmm. you know I mean there's no way to avoid that and obviously you're not going to cancel something like senior night and you've got to take the trophy and you know I, I, I don't know I, I can understand why people would think cutting the nets down is the wrong message. I mean, I, I think there's just as much argument to be made for the fact that this team has accomplished something and has come a long way to do it. Which and, is what they were saying and, after the game. And maybe should be allowed that feeling. Um, you know, I mean, maybe that's part of the growing process for this team as we get into... Sunday as we get into Chicago, as we get into the NCAA tournament, is kind of understanding that feeling... Um, you know, of at least the gratification or, or whatever you want to say. Um, I don't I don't think it's a huge deal. I also think, honestly, it's probably... I, I, I personally, anyway, think it's kind of a cool thing that they're going to put up their own banner for this year, like they did with the 83 championship, which is called the Fans Banner. I, most people probably know that. But um, the 83 uh, Big Ten championship has its own banner. And I think they're. It, it, Tom Green said tonight they're going to put up a, a separate banner for this one too. They're not going to put it on the list with all the other years. So it's going to get it. 2013 will get its own uh, individual banner. I think that's good. I mean, I think that makes sense. I think mm-hmm. that's a nice move. Um, but you know, like you said, and really like Tom Green said, I mean, this is, you know, it, basically Indiana needs to just forget about all that now. Mm-hmm. You know, and. And I would imagine they probably will, because I imagine that you know that trophy ceremony is probably not a, a, a memory that anybody's going to want to hold on to too tightly. They'll probably appreciate the accomplishment in the long run, but you know I don't know that anybody's going to want to really remember how it feels to, to hoist a trophy like you said. I mean, it, it, nobody was even smiling. You know, I mean, everybody just. It, it, I think I said on Twitter it was like getting to open somebody else's presents. You know, like like. Yeah, this is a great thing, but it really doesn't feel like it at all. Um, and for anyone who's curious, they've already put a new net. They have. They've already replaced the nets. They cut them both down, and they've really already put them, put them both back up. So, because I would imagine practice might start early tomorrow. Um, they can still win the outright at yeah. Michigan. That's that's the other thing to say. And they can still get number know, one seeds. And I don't know. I don't believe Michigan has lost at home this year. Mm-hmm. Um, one team. Yeah. So it's not going to be easy. Obviously. But they could still get the outright, and if Michigan State beats Wisconsin, beats Northwestern, they probably still get the number one seed. In fact, I think if that happens, they're guaranteed the number one seed, no matter Indiana. Indiana, yes. As long as Michigan State beats Wisconsin and Northwestern and wins out, as long as Michigan State is in any tiebreaker scenario for the number one seed in the, in the Big Ten tournament, Indiana will basically be guaranteed the number one seed, no matter what happens against Michigan. So. That, that much we are almost positive we have deduced <laughs> yeah. tonight. It is now 2.15. We want to go home. You will probably watch this at a reasonable hour tomorrow I or the next so. day or someday in the future. For your sake. Okay. Yes, I hope no one is sitting awake waiting for Inside <laughs> Indiana Overtime to be posted before they go to bed. Thanks for joining us uh, all year. This is your last look at Assembly Hall.
for 2013. There will be a different banner up there, apparently. Probably, I would imagine that will happen relatively soon, um, but I'm sure after the season. Uh, so, yeah, we're done here. We're done at Assembly Hall. We'll be live and in color from Chrysler Arena on Sunday, and then we'll be at the United Center next week. For so. the beautiful state of Michigan. It's pure. Mm-hmm. Pure Michigan. Yes. I've seen the signs. I've seen the commercials. I prove it. For Alex McCarthy, Michigander. For Zach Osterman, Sleepy Ginger. Thanks for joining us, and have a great whatever, wherever you are in your life at this moment.